Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's so good to have all of you here today for yet another uh, conversation. Uh, today we're very blessed to have uh, Dr. Jonathan Brown with us. Uh, he's come uh, from Georgetown and uh, he'll be talking about his latest book, uh, which you can see right here called uh, Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenge and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy. Um, what I was hoping to do today was we call this series that we do, which a lot of you have been to in the past, a conversation. And so we thought we would actually do a conversation this time and see how it goes. Um, so I'll be asking a few questions to uh, Dr. Brown. Um, and then after that, uh, we'll open it up to the audience um, and, uh, and take questions from you all. Um, so a little bit about the Muslim Life Program for those of you who are uh, coming back and for those of you who are new. Uh, to the program. Uh, the Muslim Life Program was established at Princeton University about seven years ago uh, when I was hired as uh, the Princeton University's first Muslim chaplain. Um, and uh, the uh, goal of the Muslim Life Program is in part really to um, offer the community that is uh, around us and the community that's on campus an opportunity to engage with critical issues uh, by bringing scholars and artists and thinkers uh, to this campus uh, who can speak to Islam as a contemporary phenomenon and as a historical reality as well. Um, and so uh, we always welcome people from the community, students, staff, faculty, and we're happy to see uh, so many different faces uh, here in the audience today. Um, so uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan Brown, I also want to tell you a little bit about some of our um, upcoming events. Um, if you look in front of you on the tables, uh, you'll find these uh, circles of knowledge that we host um, on a weekly basis. Um, and you can see all the different circles of knowledge uh, that we're hosting. Um, these circles of knowledge are about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. They're about uh, Quranic uh, reading and scripture and interpretation. Uh, they're about uh, understanding Muslim history through new lenses um, and so much more. Um, and so I, I encourage all of you to check out these circles that happen on a weekly basis. Take the fly home with you and think about which circle of knowledge uh, you would like to join. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we have uh, an event coming up this uh, Sunday, uh, which is a qawali. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a qawali is, a uh, qawali is a, a mystical uh, South Asian uh, performance um, in which uh, there is poetry and philosophy uh, that is really sung from the heart and, uh, and is something really quite powerful. Um, and so it's going to be this Sunday, uh, starting at 2 p.m. in uh, Natty Commons. Um, and if you're not on the email list, then please join the email list uh, so that you know of all of our upcoming events and the details uh, there. Um, also, uh, in December, uh, I think it's December 9th, um, we're going to be uh, having a conversation with a professor here at Princeton University by the name of Michael Berry, um, who teaches uh, Islamic history of uh, South Asia and uh, Islamic Spain and uh, so on and so forth. And so he's um, come out with a new translation and a marvelous illustration of this famous uh, Sufi poem uh, in history that is known more commonly as Conference of the Birds, but as Michael Berry likes to call it, the Canticle of the Birds. Um, and so he is going to be presenting on that, um, and that's going to be in McCormick uh, 101 starting at uh, 6 o'clock. And so once again, if you're not on the email list, please do join the email list um, so that you can stay abreast of all of our events and programs. Um, in terms of today's event, uh, we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Jonathan Brown with us today. Uh, he holds the Prince uh, Al-Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization and is an Associate Professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. He is also the Associate Director of Georgetown Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He received his BA in History from Georgetown University in 2000 and his doctorate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago in 2006. Dr. Brown has studied and conducted research in places such as Egypt, Syria, Turkey, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Indonesia, I India, and Iran. Uh, his uh, book publications include The Canonization of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, The Formation and Function of the Sunni Hadith Canon, uh, hadith, uh, Muhammad's Legacy in the Medieval and Modern World, uh, Muhammad, A Very Short Introduction, and Misquoting Muhammad, which is his latest book, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy. He has published articles in the fields of hadith, Islamic law, Sufism, Arabic, 
lexical theory and pre-Islamic poetry, and is the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islamic Law. Dr. Brown's current research focuses on modern conflicts between late uh, Sunni traditionalism <coughs> and Salafism in Islamic thought. Um, I hope that uh, you have seen uh, his book being uh, sold outside as you were coming in, um, and I encourage you to uh, purchase a, a copy of his book and maybe ha even have it signed by him uh, before you uh, leave today. Um, and uh, so with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Brown to come and join me over here. joining us. Thanks for inviting me. Um, <laughs> Dr. Brown came in uh, just today uh, earlier and we've had a lot of uh, fun chatting with him on our ride to Princeton um, and then he met with a few students early. Uh, he's been very generous with his time. Um, so I want to start off with some very uh, basic questions uh, and in, again the, the, the new people have come. Uh, feel free to take a seat right here on the floor or on the, on the staircase, on the steps. Uh, whatever it yeah, it's, the, it's like those uh, congressional hearings. You know, <laughs> the photographers are all on the ground. Exactly. <laughs> so if, you, if you're all the way up here, you have to take some pictures. Uh, make sure you know that. Um, so uh, we're going to start off with some uh, basic uh, questions um, about uh, about this topic, um, and then we're going to move more into the contents of the book, um, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, and so the first question I have for you, uh, Dr. Brown, is a very basic question, uh, which is essentially, who was Muhammad the prophet? And why does he matter so much today? Wow, I wasn't expecting that question. The <laughs> <laughs> prophet Muhammad bin Abdullah, the, the prophet Muhammad, who was you know, born around 575, 72 in the Common Era, died 632 of the Common Era. And uh, he lived in the eastern, uh, the, the western part, in the western part of Arabia. He's from a city called Mecca. Uh, and he then moved with his followers to Medina, about uh, 200 miles north. And he was the Muslims believe he's the last, final messenger of God, sent with the last version of the eternal religion that had been sent to every prophet throughout human history, to every community throughout human history. Um, belief in one God, to do good deeds, prepare for the day of judgment. And uh, that after the death of the prophet, the revelation would be cut off from human beings and people would have to uh, look back to you know, his teachings and the, the revelation that he received, specifically the Quran, which Muslims believe is you know, the word of God, that uh, they would have to look to these sources to understand uh, what God wanted from them. So he's very important because he's the final, he's the final prophet, at least you know, from a Muslim perspective. And uh, because there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, and this tends to be fairly common belief amongst them, and motivates some of them in some ways and all of them in other ways, uh, very important you know, historical figure. A, a little louder, please. Okay, I will speak louder. Thank you for telling. I appreciate it. Um, and so, uh, when you when you think about uh, Muhammad the prophet, not only through the lens of uh, of a Muslim, but also in terms of religious studies, uh, is he comparative to to a figure in another religious tradition? Sometimes people would say uh, Muhammad is to Islam what Jesus is to Christianity. Would those be fair comparisons, or would you uh, give a different analogy? Well, uh, I was just uh, talking to one of the students here, sort of telling him all about religious studies, which is a very contested field. And I'm sure people within religious studies would uh, you know, love to deconstruct that question and explain to you why it was a terrible question. It's a very complicated uh, question, right? I think it was a good question. So. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that uh, if you look at uh, ma many interpretive traditions, any interpretive tradition, I think, where you're basically uh, a group of people, a community of people who's trying to make sense of the world and derive norms and rules for themselves uh, by looking back at some event in the past and by constantly returning to that event or to that scripture or to that source uh, 
through history. So for example, the United States uh, relationship with the Constitution. So the fact that you know, people in the United States laws in the United States are determined by constantly going back to this document and trying to understand what it means in different times and places and sort of navigating your relationship with this document through history to try and figure out what's right and wrong. That's a, that's a good example of an interpretive tradition. And so Islam is an interpretive tradition in the sense that because Muslims are constantly looking back at the scriptural sources of their religion in the Islamic tradition, the scriptural sources are the Quran, the Word of God, and more importantly, I would say, in, in fact, Muslims would say if they were being accurate, more importantly is the, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, which is referred to as the Sunnah, the Sunnah, or the tradition. In, in Latin, you call it traditio, like in Catholicism. And the Quran is understood through the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and also supplemented heavily by the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. So everybody knows about how Muslims pr pray five times a day. The Quran doesn't tell you to pray five times a day. This comes from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. It's added on to the Quran. Okay. So uh, if you look at the Abrahamic religions, they're structurally virtually identical, and that you have a primary scripture, which is at first oral, then quickly written down. In Judaism, you have the, the the, the, the Torah, the five books of Moses. In Christianity, you have the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible. In Islam, you have the Quran. And these, these primary scriptures that are quickly written down are interpreted through a secondary scripture, which is oral. It's oral, sometimes for a long time, and then it's also written down. So in, Christian, in Judaism, you have the oral Torah, which is given to Moses on Mount Sinai along with the written Torah, and it is then passed on generation to generation until it becomes the rabbinic law of the, the rabbis, which is set down in writing in around 200 AD in the form of the Mishnah. In Christianity, the oral teachings of Jesus are the lens through which the Old Testament is interpreted. So Judaism and Christianity are two different lenses for looking at the same primary scripture, namely the Old Testament. One through the teachings of the rabbis, Judaism. One through the teachings of one particular rabbi, Jesus. Right? In the is Islamic tradition, you have the Quran as a primary scripture, quickly written down. And it's interpreted through the secondary scripture, namely the Sunnah of the Prophet, which is written down in, some, in, in one way, but also transmitted through tradition in another way. And in fact, the different sects of Muslims and the different schools of thought within those sects they basically are created by different inter different definitions of what that sunnah, what that secondary scripture is, and what it means. So there is a, a the prophet Muhammad is sort of comparable to um, uh, comparable to the role of Jesus in Christianity and the role of uh, the the rab rabbinic tradition in uh, in Judaism. And so uh, when you were giving your answer, you um, said something about uh, sunnah. Uh, you talked about you know the, the prophet's path being described as the sunnah. Um, now, what's the difference between hadith and sunnah? What would hadith okay. be and what is sunnah? And does that really matter? Or is it just a technical? Big thing? difference. Big, big, not technical. Another good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, the sunnah is. If this is Princeton, so everybody's fairly educated, right? So you, you talk about <laughs> the traditio and the. La I'm from Georgetown, which is Jesuit school. So we all know this. Traditio is the. The body of teaching and interpretation is built up on top of the Bible to explain it. So if, you, if, you're, you know, if you're a Catholic and you want to go learn about Catholicism, you don't go read the Bible. You go talk to a priest who's going to tell you what the tradition says, what the kind of, you know, just like if you want to know what the Constitution says about, let's say, the right to privacy, you don't go to the Constitution and try and find it. Anyone, they don't even read the Constitution. No, you wait for the Supreme Court to tell you what the Constitution means. So. Uh, the Sunnah is the the original lens through which the Quran is interpreted. Now, the, how you decide what the Sunnah is and what it means that is going to send you in lots of different directions in terms of how you understand <coughs> Islam as a religion. One approach to thinking about the Sunnah is that it's literally just a process of writing down or recording specific things the Prophet said. You know, how did he tell you to take your shoes off? How did he rule on a case where a husband and wife were disputing over something? How did he deal with a case where somebody killed someone else? 
How did he talk about, what did he say about the day of judgment? What did he say about how you should treat your neighbor and things like that? So you just record all these little sayings and his judgments, and you take these together, and you try and figure out, okay, what is the prophet teaching on this issue? What is he teaching on that issue? And you try and figure out how these things relate to each other, these sayings, and then how they relate to the Quran. So these individual sayings are called hadiths, plural, a singular hadith, plural in Arabic, a hadith, but we say usually hadith for singular and plural in English. And uh, so that's one source that people look at, Muslim scholars look to as a way of understanding the sunnah. Uh, however, there's a big difference between, let's say, a hadith and a sunnah because um, my sunnah, and this is to use Sherman Jackson's analogy, I'll give him credit and I'll engage in the proper you know, proper behavior of a Muslim scholar by citing my source. So Professor Sherman Jackson from USC says, you know, my, uh, my sunnah is, let's say, that I bring a, a rose home to my wife every day. That's my sunnah. Now, one day I might forget or the flower, flower shop is closed. So uh, Nabil, who's my student, he's sitting outside my house because he's a grad student and he's you know, trying to stalk me. So he says, I come home without a rose. So he says, I saw John, uh, Jonathan Brown go home without a rose. That's, his, that's correct. That is correct. I did that. But that's not my sunnah. That, is, that doesn't represent my teaching. However, it can tell us something important. Because if I'm a perfect human being, like the Prophet Muhammad, if I don't do something, it means it's not required. <coughs> if one day I didn't come home with a rose, it means it's not required to take a rose. It might be highly recommended, but it's not required. So that piece of data can be very useful. Now, another way of thinking about the Sunnah is, well, you know, let's not think about the Prophet's teachings as little pieces of data that we collect and we try and fit together. Let's think about it as a living tradition. So what better way to learn how to pray? It's the Hager Mount, right? Okay, you actually only did one tasmeen, which I've never had a Maliki do. I was waiting for some Maliki to do that, the prayer he led. So the, in, in a Maliki school of law, which was founded in the si very city that the Prophet Muhammad lived in, Medina, uh, it, had a, it had one particular approach to the Prophet Sunnah, which was, you know, we're living in a city that the Prophet founded. Everybody here was taught Islam by the Prophet Muhammad, and their, or their parents or their grandparents. So if we want to know how to pray, we're not going to go listen to these little reports. We're going to actually look at how people pray in our city. So the, the Muslims here today, very few of them, I think, learned how to pray from reading a book. They probably learned how to pray from their parents, or how to pray from their parents, from their parents, et cetera, et cetera. It's another way of thinking about the sunnah. Now you can see there's a problem here, because anytime you play a game of telephone or you look at tradition, uh, over time, you see tradition changes. Even if people think it's always the same, you know, my mom's Thanksgiving dinner is not the original Thanksgiving dinner that was cooked whenever Thanksgiving started in the 1860s or 1870s. So even though we think of tradition as being static, in reality it changes. So that's dangerous. Uh, another way of thinking about Sunnah is that it's a way of uh, maybe a, a method of problem solving <coughs> that the Prophet had us you know, taught a set of principles and an approach to the world. And when you're presented with a new question about, you know, is this type of food allowed? Or what do I do with, you know, home mortgage in the United States? Can I get a mortgage or can I get a, mor a loan to get a car? Or what do I do about, you know, um, the w how do I wear my hijab as in the United States if I'm a Muslim woman? These questions, that it's not necessarily that you're going to look back at a set amount of little snippets of data, but rather the prophet taught ways to address these situations, different values and principles that you use. So these are all valid and different ways of thinking about the sunnah that actually coexist amongst Muslim schools of law and amongst Muslim sects, and how they weigh them and how they put them together gives you different results. Um, now, uh, speaking a little bit more in depth about hadith, um, you're probably one of the foremost scholars of hadith today in the West. Um, and so, um, <laughs> uh, and, and I highly recommend reading his book on hadith, which gives a lot of detail on how hadith was selected and so on and so forth. But essentially, if we're saying that um, hadith is uh, one of the primary ways of knowing the sunnah, um, then the question comes as to um, how, how, is, how, is, uh, how are hadith evaluated? How are, how are hadith, first of all, how are they collected? And then, how are they evaluated as being as as knowing whether they truly came from the prophet or came from some other source? And are those issues contended now, or are they kind of dead in history? So, when I talk about scripture 
and uh, compared, you know, different interpretive traditions of the Abrahamic religion, I talked about how the secondary scripture especially is originally not written down. A lot of people not write something down if they want to preserve it. Um, this is a good question. Uh, the reason is that when you write something down, it becomes very dangerous. When you write something down, it can then be read and misunderstood. This is a say you can, you're all, you know, some of your Princeton students, now you've all read probably uh, Plato's uh, Protagoras Dialogue, is it his, uh, no, Phaedrus Dialogue, where Plato talks about the, how writing was invented and how some Egyptian god came, came up with this great idea of a way to, that human beings could not forget things. So they would write things down. And then the big god, the big Egyptian god, says to this little demigod, god, that's a really bad idea. What you invented is something very dangerous. Because writing is the dead, it's a bastard child of knowledge. It's dead knowledge. Living knowledge is the, the real legitimate child of knowledge, is oral knowledge. Because when you learn something from a teacher, you can ask questions. You make sure you don't misunderstand. When you read something out of, out of a book, you can misunderstand. Not only can you get misunderstand, but anybody can go and pick up that book. And anybody can start telling you what that book means. So you lose interpretive control. You lose control of who defines the message of a religion or of, a, of, a, of a whatever ideology you're talking about. So the reason why both, it, when you look at the oral Torah and Judaism, the New Testament or the teachings of Jesus in Christianity and the uh, uh, teachings of the prophet in uh, Islam, in fact, also in, in Zen Buddhism, Zen Buddhist teaching, there, you have a resistance to writing things down because of the threat that it presents. But then you have to write it down because be, uh, the risk of it being vitiated and lost is too great. So the, in the Islamic tradition, of course, if you belong to, in, in the first 100, basically the first 150 years of Islamic history, you have three major civil wars amongst the Muslim community. Uh, so, and the Muslim community goes from being in Arabia to everywhere from Iberian Peninsula to, ch ch to China. <coughs> Anybody who has any idea, who they want to, to advance any political agenda or sectarian agenda or cultural agenda, they immediately start making up hadiths and saying, I'm, you know, I'm Persian, I like wearing pants. We Persians invented pants, right? So I'm gonna say the prophet said, it is really great to wear pants. Whoever wears pants is gonna go to hell, heaven. <laughs> or, you know, I'm, I follow, I'm, I'm this side in the Civil War. The prophet said that, you know, there will be a civil war and the person who follows Jonathan Brown will be victorious. So you find these kinds of hadiths generated all the time. And the Muslim scholars were aware of this very early. So they had to try and figure out a way of, of sorting out what was authentic and not authentic hadiths. And uh, again, uh, the question of whether, let's say you believe a certain hadith is authentically attributed to the prophet or not, is going to have a big impact on what kind of Muslim you are, what sect you belong to, or how these sects and schools of thoughts were formed, schools of thought were formed. And it, sorry, it is very contested today, both amongst Muslims and also among the non-Muslim, you know, Western study of the Islamic tradition. So moving a little bit to your latest book, uh, the main title is Misquoting Muhammad. Uh, why did you, uh, what, 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 what made you interested in writing a book about this, and what are some of the most egregious <coughs> examples that you can think of of misquoting Muhammad? Well, uh, the book title was actually the publisher's idea. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Bart Ehrman wrote this book called Misquoting Jesus, which sold you know, a zillion copies. So they said, oh, you should write a book called Misquoting Muhammad. And they actually said, you, you know, we'll give you a contract for the book. And I had no idea what was going to be in the book. I said the title. <laughs> so I, I said to the editor, I, you know, I said, really, actually, I'm very uncomfortable. I don't want to write that kind of book about the Islamic tradition. So he said, why don't you think about it in terms of contesting the prophet's legacy instead of, and say, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. So the, the subtitle, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy, for me, that's the real title of the book. Um, that, you know, the question is how Muslims have tried to make sense of their scriptural heritage in different times and places, and especially as they've confronted the, the challenges of modernity, uh, as, by the way, all religious traditions have. <coughs> but uh, you're right, and there, there are some great examples of misquoting the prophet. Muslim scholars were, uh, especially after the 1300s, they started writing these books that would list kind of hadiths that were people were citing in the streets and you know in people's houses and in the market. They would go and these things that people are saying the prophet said, what, which is something the pro, you know, what is something the prophet actually said, what is just something someone's making up? And so you get these great lists 
of what's being you know said in, in the streets of 14th century Cairo or, or 17th century Istanbul. And you see lots of interesting stuff. I mean, uh, boy, some of it's super offensive. <laughs> uh, you got everything in there. Um, but I mean, one thing that is, uh, I mean, I, actually, just the other day, I was giving a talk, book talk, and this student said, um, oh, we we're talking about women, uh, religious r role of women religious leaders in the Islamic tradition. And uh, we're talking about mm -hmm. women giving speeches in public. And so uh, one student who was, a, who was a woman, a female Muslim, said, well, what about the prophets saying that South uh, al-Marati Aura, which means that the, a woman's voice is her part of her, like, I guess it's a very difficult term to translate, but private parts, nudity. So your aura is a part of your body you can't show, you know. So in America, your aura is for a guy, unless you're jogging, you know, probably you have to have your top covered and your, you know, no shirts, no shoes, no service or something like that. Uh, in some parts, of, like I think in Ontario, you're not allowed to go jogging uh, with your shirt off too if you're a guy. So for women, you know, we have an idea of what women's private parts are in, uh, in America as well. So what this, this student was saying is the prophet said that a woman's voice is part of her private part, so she can't go out and speak in public. And I said, that's, that's not a hadith. It's not a hadith at all. If people will say it and attribute it to the prophet, but it's not in any way something that the prophet said. No one would even really claim that. It just kind of spread uh, popularly. It's just a position in one of the schools of law, uh, but not, uh, not certainly not in all of the schools of law. So that's a good example. And and so when it comes to um, you know when it comes to uh, hadith, and now you've opened up. You know that discussion on uh, hadith that are deemed to be misogynistic or uh, to be uh, not very friendly toward toward women's rights. Um, there's a very interesting uh, debate about the use of reason in the collection of hadith, um, and uh, you talk about this in your book as well. That when hadith were being collected, the Sunnis in particular, uh, you know, tried their best, uh, seemingly not to use reason and just collect hadith based on the narrators. Uh, but then every now and then you cite examples of where they did use their reason, and they say that the, the, the chain of narration seems fine, but this quite doesn't quite make sense. Now some of the scholars today, like Khalid al Fadl and others, will say that maybe the scholars of the past didn't have their right antennas on when it came to hadith about women. Um, that there's hadith about women that just d doesn't seem like it would be appropriate for the prophet uh, to, to mention, but maybe back then they didn't have the right antenna to be able to decipher these things. Um, how would you respond to that? So the, when I mentioned that Muslim scholars, beginning, you know, really from the first couple of decades of Islamic history, you know, they, they found that hadiths were being um, forged <coughs> in the thousands. And when I say Muslim scholars, by the way, I think a good, a good maybe mental image to have for those of you who aren't familiar with this the, the phenomenon of Muslim scholars or ulama, they're like Muslim rabbis. So they're uh, in the Islamic tradition, the, the, the idea of a there's not a clergy, but what there are are there people who are the guardians of of the knowledge of sacred knowledge, the guardians of the knowledge of God's religion and God's law, and like rabbis they think of their job as being the job of scholars. So they, their job is the study and the preservation of the sacred knowledge and its development over time. They're the people who's, who developed Islamic law. They served as judges in the Sharia courts of Islamic civilization. They wrote histories. They were, they were the intellectuals and the intellectual elite of the Muslim, of Muslim civilization. Uh, so um, they, had a, they had a challenge, which is how do we determine whether or not something is a hadith that the prophet said or whether something is made up. And the challenge was great because if you, you know, if, if I asked you today, uh, for example, Nabil, you know, um, I saw, uh, I saw, for example, uh, there's someone else here I know. Um, Osama. I saw Osama levitating outside earlier. He's floating around like this. He was going and shooting flames at people. Uh, would you believe that or not? I would. Uh, I would if you were someone who was considered. Stop an trying to act like Muslim. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying no, I'm not going to no. be back because it's ridiculous. Right? People don't levitate.
allowed to take everyone shoots flames out. <laughs> now, if I said, you know, I saw Osama, he, you know, he was, the people didn't have enough water to drink, and he took his fingers and he put his fingers in the bucket of water, and water started shooting out from between his fingers, and everybody had enough water to drink. I wouldn't <coughs> believe that because that doesn't happen. Well, what happens if you're the, a prophet of God and God can make makes miracles happen at your hands? Now that rule doesn't work anymore. That, that rule of criticism doesn't work anymore. Okay, let's say I say, Nabil, um, you have to dye your hair orange and then uh, you know, walk around with a sign saying, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. <laughs> okay, you have to do that. You say, no, that, that's ridiculous, that's unfair, that's you know, victimizing me. I go to Princeton. Yeah, you go to Princeton, you do that. So, but what if I'm the prophet of God? I actually direct, God told me to tell you to do this. He told me this is part of your religion. Now you're kind of, it seems wrong and weird, but he says, the, who am I to judge the prophet? So if, you, if the person your, your, your things are being attributed to is your source of morality, then other moral tests, so the litmus test, or your, or your moral compass <coughs> otherwise, doesn't really work to evaluate his statements. So this is one of the challenges. This one, when they said, when they was saying they wanted to remove reason from the equation of authenticating these reports, they had a good reason to do that. A good reason to do that because they didn't think, who are we to really evaluate the nature of what the prophet is saying? So they tried to figure out a way of evaluating the authenticity of hadiths based on their their transmission. You know, is a is a report corroborated? Who's the source? Is there an unbroken chain of transmission back to that source? Uh, unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, um, but people are not able to turn their brains off. People are always going to be reacting to things they hear based on their own assumptions, on their backgrounds, on their culture, uh, on their biases. And so uh, they were, uh, let's say if, if, if we were you know, living in the, in the 1880s, and someone said, you know, there's going to come a time when human beings will go to Mars and take pictures, and Mars will actually have water on it, and there'll be a little creature, that, you know, a little chariot that walks around on Mars. And so that's ridiculous. Now, oh, that's totally, you know, we, we know there's Mars rovers, and people go into, we've gone to the moon. So we're, uh, the way we react to the plausibility of a report is based on our own experience, and our, our culture, our notion of technology, even our notion of what the rules of nature are. So uh, we can't help but react to things. So if I heard a report in 1880 about Mars, I'd be very skeptical. I wouldn't be able. I would be forced to be like, mm, maybe the transmission of this report's not so reliable. Now, if I believe, if I come from a culture that's, let's say, very pa uh, um, patriarchal, where women aren't, you know, are generally not participants in public life, uh, if I come across a hadith that supports that. I'm not going to be skeptical about it. I'm just going to say, oh, this makes sense. Like if you're, you know, if you're American, you come across a story about how democracy is great. You don't sit there and say, oh, I don't want to know if this is true or not. You know, yeah, okay, democracy. We already know democracy is great, so I'm not going. But if you come across a report where George Washington says, you know, uh, verily thou shalt all, you know, become members of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and you know, <laughs> the state should rule the control the means of production and all these things. You might say, hey, wait a second, I'm not sure George Washington really said this. We need to look at the source and check out if it's, if it's correct. So people are always going to be uh, creatures of their, it's hard for people to escape their biases. So sometimes uh, they actually would, would, would actually un be un unable to escape this or to turn their brains off completely. Is there a difference in the way that Shias would collect and uh, understand hadith and, and, and rationality in hadith and other schools of thought that would differ from the way Sunni. So I should specify that in, ev in every school of thought in Islam, in theory, if a hadith contradicts the Quran, or if it contradicts the known Sunnah of the Prophet, or if it contradicts reason, it has to be false. In theory. But in practice, it's very, I mean, what's a contradiction? What is reason? Is something a contradiction, or just am I not understanding something properly? Uh, you know, are two laws really contradicting each other, or are they just 
do I just not really understand how they relate? Uh, so, although in theory they, they held these positions, they were, at least in the Sunni tradition, they were very, very, very wary of using this method of criticism. In the, what became the mainstream Shiite tradition, they were more, uh, much more willing to engage in that kind of criticism. So in the Shiite tradition, uh, which you see in Iran and, and southern Iraq and, and Lebanon and uh, Pakistan and India, the uh, mainstream scholarly, the mainstream school of thought uh, is um, more willing to subject individual hadith reports to uh, established understandings of what the Quran says and what first principles of reason are. Um, so uh, right now I think a lot of people are driven by you know, maybe even coming to this talk or talk similar to this uh, because they're very concerned about the question of Islam and modern violence. Um, and sometimes they'll even read stories or tradition uh, reports uh, that are being used by Muslim groups uh, or uh, groups that claim to be Muslim like ISIS. Um, and you also hear it from the Islamophobes or the anti-Muslim sentiment that Muhammad was a warrior and this and that. And so when you uh, examine or when you think about modern violence and you think about Islam uh, and the prophetic legacy, um, share some reflections on that. Do you think there's misquoting of Muhammad or misinterpreting, or do you think that these are all just contentious issues? I mean, I, I th Islam is a, as a religious tradition, a civilizational tradition, is vast. Uh, it's vast in its uh, geographical breadth, in its, its history, in its richness. And, um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like, you know, asking a lawyer, you know, or telling a lawyer, you can't make that argument. I guess I can. I'm a lawyer. I can make any argument. You know, it's like saying that, you know, the, the con you know, Constitution or American <coughs> legal tradition won't allow you to make this argument or that argument. You can make any argument you want. And you can probably come up with a really good set of supporting evidence for that argument. And maybe you'll convince some people. Maybe you won't. Maybe it's a lousy argument. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's lousy and it still convinces people. So anytime you're dealing with a really rich tradition, I think it's it's very hard to say that uh, you know that that tradition is always going to give you a certain kind of result. So you know the the Prophet Muhammad was a person who was a uh, he was a leader in peace time. He was a leader in war time. He was a political leader. He was a religious leader. He was a judge. He was a father, a son, a husband, um, a friend, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, his life gives you so much material, and the early history of the Islamic community gives you so much material, a, a lot of it not reliable, not historically reliable, um, that if you want to go back and make, you know, Mr. Potato Head out of those little pieces that's going to look the way you want a Mr. Potato Head to look, you can do that. And so what you really have to look at, I think, is not you know, what does Islam say, or, or what is Islam always going to guarantee as a, its teaching, but what are the, what are the motivations or the, the forces that create a specific group in, in, in one time and place? So there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, and based on, I think, I, <coughs> the largest, the sort of, mo the widest definition of terrorist, which just includes like anybody who's doing something violent, which is not accurate, and the smallest global estimate for Muslim population, I calculated that Basically, 0.006% of the Muslim population in the world is terrorist. So that's a in statistically insignificant amount. Uh, the rest of you know people like Bill Maher or Sam Harris, they say you know Islam causes violence. But you know, what what about the you know if only 0.006% of Muslims are engaging in violence, then what about the rest? The rest of them, they're still Muslim, and they're just going and you know buying kebab and selling you know mangoes or whatever they're selling. <laughs> Uh, we're sitting on the floor of this lecture hall. So there. Uh, so I mean, I, I think you know, you look when you, where you look at violence in the Muslim world, it's it's places that are traumatized. I mean, we. I don't. I, I for one think it's absolutely ludicrous that any Muslim is asked to explain why ISIS is doing what ISIS is doing. First of all, not my problem. I, I'm not in charge of ISIS. Okay. If I could get on the phone with them and say, hey guys, stop beheading people, I, I would do that. And if they listen to me, I would, a lot of people have. A lot of really, really conservative Muslim scholars have told them this, and they don't listen. Okay. So, you know, you look at a country like, you know, in Iraq, it's a country that was 
you know, invaded in 2003 based on premises that are completely, were completely false. And every institution, political, social institution in that country was taken apart, okay? It was uh, systematically mismanaged by the occupying forces, during which time, according to the Lancet, some 750,000 people were killed between 2003 and 2013. 750,000 people, maybe even a million people, were killed uh, as a result of this invasion. And now, now is a complete uh, mess. And then some group arises that is violent and crazy, and by the way, like one third of its leadership consists of Saddam Hussein Sunni army officers, who were all, who met in prison under American detention in Iraq. And so, in that situation, if it were any other country, if it were like Christians or Northern Ireland, we wouldn't sit around and say, what's the problem with Christianity or, or, or Protestantism or Catholicism? Why, what's wrong with Protestants? <coughs> We'd recognize immediately this is a product of the political situation and the trauma that this country had gone through. Uh, and the fact that you know, Muslims are being, or Islam is being accused of this, being the cause of this problem, this is simply uh, a distraction. This is trying to shift the blame away from the actual cause, which is the, the, the condition that Iraq was put in and left in since 2003. And that was done by the government of this country, along with its allies. And, and people don't want to take responsible for that, responsibility for that, so they want to blame Muslims. They want to blame Islam, and that's absolute nonsense. It's illogical. It wouldn't be allowed to happen by reasonable people who were any other uh, religion. Um, at this point, uh, I want to open it up to uh, the audience, um, and in typical Princeton fashion, um, we're going to take the first few questions from uh, Princeton students, um, and then we'll uh, open it up to the wider community. Um, so, Princeton students, this is your chance to ask a brilliant question. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> well, more brilliant than my question. Your questions were good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone? Go first. All right, Ismail. Um, so you were just mentioning ISIS, and I went to a talk maybe a week or two ago that uh, I guess the person I was speaking was basically saying that the main issue behind, I mean, obviously ISIS. Ideologically, like what they are, what their big goal of is this exterior ideology. Um, and I think we're talking about pedophism and comparing that to that. And I guess my question is I mean, if you could talk a little about this exterior ideology, but also I, I want to, I was hoping that you could maybe focus on this idea of pedophism or you know, what it actually means and what that encompasses, because there are some people that say that. Very good questions. Uh, so, um, again, a useful uh, the analogy isn't exact, but it's very useful. You know, in, in Islam, you, you know, in Christianity, you have Protestantism and Catholicism. So, Catholicism holds that you know this continuous tradition that goes back to Saint Peter, and that um, if you build on this tradition, it it, it it accurately reflects the teachings of Jesus. And then this other movement develops in the 1500s. It says, no, actually, this tradition has betrayed the original teachings of Jesus in important ways, and we need to go back to the scriptural sources and, and really uh, reapproach the, the Bible, the teachings of Jesus, uh, immediately, uh, kind of bypassing this tradition, which is overall Protestantism. So uh, in the Islamic tradition, you have the same, tra same two schools of thought, or the same two stra uh, strands of thought. Um, Probably the, the mainstream or the majority, uh, and you have it in, in, within Sunni Islam and within Shiite Islam. The majority uh, of Muslim scholars, and sort of by definition, the majority of, of Muslims, uh, follow the, the more Catholic approach. Um, and uh, yet, powerful uh, minorities and very convincing minorities, you know, advocate the Protestant approach. This is something you really see in the Islamic world. It's it's always there, but it really flares up a lot in the 1300s, and then a lot in the 1700s. And one of the movements that uh, is the, one of the most influential such sort of Islamic Protestant movements is the uh, movement that begins in Central Arabia. There's an alliance between a scholar named Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, who died 1292, and the, the first Saudi state, the first the, the, the Saud family of Dir'iyah in Central, what's now Saudi Arabia, Central Nej. 
it, this political and religious alliance forms, and it then has one state, gets defeated, another state gets defeated, third Saudi state, which is current Saudi Arabia. Okay, so it started founded around 1902. Now, uh, so uh, that's that idea of going back to the sort of Protestant idea of going back to the original scriptures and not being bound by tradition, capital T, not tradition like, you know, mo my mom's Thanksgiving dinner. Tradition in the sense that the body of interpretation is built up around scripture. Not being bound by tradition, that's uh, often referred to as Salafism. Going back to se the Salaf, the Salaf are the early, the early Muslim community. Now, uh, a lot of times people think of Salafis as you know, m maybe more extreme, more conservative Muslims. They're not necessarily more conservative or more extreme than anybody else, but uh, they would tend to look a little bit more Amish probably than, uh, you know, let's say, Suhail here. So, Suhail, sorry, I was talking about the name. Suhail has a nice short beard. <laughs> I have a nice short beard. Uh, some people have no beards, right? Some Muslims have no beards. Uh, that's allowed in many of the Muslim schools, Sunni schools of law. But if you really want to be just like the Prophet, you'd have like a big, big, big bushy beard with no mustache. So you would look like one of these old, you know, Abraham Lincoln pictures in the Civil War or something like that. So that would, you know, uh, Salafis are more inclined to go back and really not take what the different schools of law say you can do, but go back really to the original, uh, what is seen as the original hadiths uh, that are describing the Prophet's conduct. Now, uh, some of these, the, the link between Salafism and violent extremism is not a necessary link at all. In fact, some of the, the Muslim scholars and the Muslim schools of thought in the modern world that are most pacifist, the most politically quietist, the most disinclined to ever get involved in politics or ever rebel against rulers are Salafi scholars. Um, because if you go back and you look at books of Hadith, you'll find things like, you know, don't rebel against the ruler even if he takes your money unjustly. So even if the ruler is a terrible, awful Muslim who takes your money and treats you terribly, you cannot rebel against him. This is an early Sunni teaching which Salafis take. Now, uh, here's where the question of extremism comes, or violent extremism comes in. You have to, if you're a Salafi, you have to obey the ruler. You cannot rebel against them. Even if they're a bloodthirsty, awful, oppressive tyrant, as long as they're nominally Muslim. They might be swilling booze and fornicating and gambling and doing whatever, but as long as they're not, they're just a lousy Muslim. But as long as they're nominally Muslim, you have to obey them. What happens if they cease to be Muslim? Then you can rebel against them. In fact, you're required to rebel against them. So the question is, what makes somebody Muslim? Now, in the, uh, the first sect in Islam that emerged, and this happens in the first civil war that uh, uh, started around uh, 660 of the Common Era. Okay. Uh, there was a group that emerged that decided that the current caliph, the current ruler, had committed a grave sin, and therefore, if he really believed in God, he wouldn't commit this sin. So the fact that he committed the sin means he doesn't really believe in God. If he doesn't really believe in God, it means he's an apostate from Islam, which means he can be killed. So you can see the logic here. I know what Islam is. You're not doing what I know Islam is. Since you're not doing what I know Islam is, you must not really be Muslim, which means you've left Islam, which means I can kill you. That's the logic of extremism, which is the exact same logic you see in basically every Muslim extremist group throughout history. And you see it today in groups like ISIS. People, you know, I, I, I very, uh, Sorry for what happened to you, the Yazidis in Iraq. But you don't have to be a Yazidi to be tormented by ISIS, because ISIS also declares Shiite Muslims to be non-Muslims, and declares Sunni Muslims who don't agree with them to be non-Muslims. So if you're a Muslim living in Iraq, you're just as likely to be killed or enslaved or whatever uh, as a non-Muslim, as a Christian or a Yazidi. Because if you're, if you, once you start thinking in that black and white logic, where I know what the real religion is, you're not agreeing with what I do, therefore you're not really Muslim. And you also see, by the way, this, is, this, this type of thinking has a kind of autoimmune element to it. Because it start, the movement starts eating itself up. Let's say, uh, you know, Osama is my leader. 
We all have agreed that Hussein Nabil is not a real Muslim anymore. He's our, we're going to kill him. He's not our leader anymore. Now, wait, what was that uh, song? What's that you're with? Is that a shirt that has buttons on it? That's looking pretty Western, actually. If you really believed in God, if you really wanted to follow the Prophet, you wouldn't wear that shirt. You'd wear it like my shirt. Now, you're not really Muslim. I kill you, and then somebody comes and does that to me. So this is actually what happened to that early sect that emerged in the First Civil War. Eventually just ate itself to pieces. and doesn't exist anymore. But its ideology appears from time to time in groups like ISIS, and also... It was, an, uh, unfortunately, uh, an integral part of the Wahhabi movement that emerged in the, the mid-1700s in what's now Saudi Arabia. <coughs> That's why the Saudi state is constantly ri really riding a tiger, because it used this extremist ideology to expand, but then it had to control this extremist ideology. The second it tried, started trying to ex control it, people within that ideology said, wait a second. Why are you saying we can't go do jihad? You're not really, are you really on board with this whole project? Are you really Muslim? And so you see that in, uh, throughout the, the, the different Saudi states, the Saudi rulers are constantly having to battle their own shock troops. This happened in 1929, when the, the, the shock troops called the Ikhwan were defeated by the, the then Saudi ruler, Abdulaziz bin Saud, died in 1953, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it happened in 1979, in a fascinating event, where a group of people, who believed that the current Saudi government was had betrayed the true teachings of Islam, took over the, the mosque in Mecca, the mosque of the Kaaba in it, the Haram Mosque, for two weeks, took it over uh, in a real bloodbath. And if you want to read an incredible page-turning book, which, I mean, it's really devastating, but it'll give you a good introduction to this, it's called The Siege of Mecca. Uh, it's a real page-turning uh, but also very disturbing. So, uh, Someone like Osama bin Laden, Al Qaeda. These are all products of that uh, of that ide of that ideology. But it's a very important term. But that ideology is not Salafi. It's an extremist ideology. <coughs> listening to your answer, a lot of people might say the problem is uh, apostasy law, like mm. this notion that if somebody uh, yeah. you know leaves Islam or your version of Islam, and that you can kill them. Where does yeah. that? even come from and how, are, how do Muslim thinkers contend with that today? Well, this is an excellent question. So in, um, and I was, I knew that this was going to come up as I was giving that explanation. So uh, this is a great example of the tension between hadiths and sunnah as maybe a living tradition or a, a, a tradition of problem solving, a, a legal interpretive tradition that's passed on from generation to generation. You have, the, the Quran very explicitly says, there's no compulsion in religion. Okay. Um, but you have the prophet in, a, in well known hadiths, he says, Whoever changes their religion, kill them, i.e., change it away from Islam. Okay. So what happens is that in the, the, at least in Sunni Islam, which I know better than the Shia tradition, uh, all the schools of law hold that somebody who leaves Islam, a Muslim leaves Islam, is this is a death penalty offense. Except the Hanafi school of law says if you're a woman and you leave Islam, it's not a death penalty offense. If you're a man, you, it is. Okay. They base this on that hadith I told you. How, how, how does that make sense? If you have a, the Quran which says there's no compulsion in religion, and you have this hadith that seems to contradict that. What? We have to, as I, as I mentioned before, people are always creatures of the, the world in which they live. And the world of the, of, you know, before the nation state, before people organize their political life according to some box, territorial box they're put in because they've been determined to be French or Spanish or Italian or whatever, uh, one of the primary identi identity markers, maybe the most important in many parts of the world, was religious identity. So when you, uh, and, and Benedict Spinoza talks about this very well in his uh, theological political treatise, in the, the religion of, of ancient Israel, if you left that religion, you were considered a traitor to the, the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel. Because the religion was what defined the boundaries of that community. There was no citizenship, you didn't get an ID card or something. Uh, there wasn't all, you know, a, a government that you were loyal to. It was, the religion was that community. So the, in Islamic civilization, loyalty to that overall polity of the world of Islam was 
your one of the people's central identity markers. And if you were to um, cast that aside, you became a, a, a traitor. And if you were to act, you know, advocate that other people also cast that identity aside, then you would basically subordinate uh, sedition or treason. Uh, and what, 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 what's interesting, if you, and this is what Muslim scholars in the, the late eight, 1800s and the 20th century until today, many traditional Muslim scholars have argued, is that the ruling on apostasy should change today because religion is now considered a matter of personal conscience. It's not a political marker. Right? You don't belong to a country or take on certain you know, tax duties or something in the United States if you're Muslim versus Jewish versus Christian. So, and what they do is they say, look, so you actually look at the prophet's behavior, not that one hadith, but you look at the way he dealt with apostates in his own community. He didn't actually kill them. They were not punished. There's one instance where there's a report about one being killed. I'm not sure that's very reliable. But the reliable reports, there's one figure, he's a Meccan, like the prophet, he becomes Muslim, he leaves Mecca, he goes to Medina, he becomes one of the prophet's scribes, he then decides he doesn't like Islam, he leaves Islam, he goes back to Mecca, starts writing insulting poetry about the prophet, then later he becomes Muslim again, and then he gets made the governor of Egypt. So he had a really interesting career. He, he apostatized, came back to Islam, and became a senior Muslim official, and nothing happened to him. So, uh, that's really what you see in the early period. Uh, and, uh, and so that's why a, a number of leading Muslim scholars today have argued that uh, you know, apostasy, it's not, ap the apostasy that is punishable by death in the Islamic tradition, in the Sharia, isn't someone changing their religious conviction. It's if you privately change your religious belief, nobody cares. But if you go out, ad if you go out and advocate that other Muslims should abandon their religion, in a Muslim state where public order is seen as being embedded at least partially in Islam, then they would argue that that's the tr equivalent of high treason, that is a death penalty offense. So that's some of the discussions about apostasy that have occurred in the modern Muslim world. Yes, I'll leave that there. Uh, so as you stated, the, the perspective, I guess, of Muslim involvement in terrorism is very skewed and uh, that could be a, a result of the media coverage. So I was just wondering what um, you thought the effect of media coverage, at least in America, was on recruitment for these types of extremist groups, whether positive or negative. Well, I think there hasn't been much of recruitment in the United States. And there's just been like, I think it was, uh, what was the FBI, like 12 or 7 people? Right, right, or something. I mean, it's been much more in Europe. Uh, which, by the way, tells you a lot. Uh, maybe it's just because you can drive there from Europe or something. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a real uh, issue, right? I mean, how are you going to get to uh, get to cross the ocean? Um, but if you look at Muslims in the United States, uh, whether they're African American Muslims or immigrant Muslims uh, or white Muslims, they, they tend to be much better integrated, at least in their own communities. And immigrant Muslims tend to be, you know, upper middle class, very educated, well integrated people. Uh, the United States is, thank God, has a great tradition of um, freedom of religious practice. Uh, well, you're right, you're right. You're not being American doesn't mean you have to wear a beret or carry a baguette or you know go to the beer garden like in Germany or something like that. You know, we're not a very homogeneous country. So our national identity isn't tied up in a language or a way of, of a or a lifestyle. And a lot of European countries, like where they're having real issues dealing with, this, with migration from Muslim countries, like France or the Netherlands or Germany, is pr precisely because there's not there's a not a clear way of understanding what it means to be French or German or Dutch, apart from a lifestyle. And when someone comes in, dresses different, and acts differently, it, it is a real challenge to that. So uh, Muslims in places like Austria and Germany and France in the UK. Uh, they have to have much, first of all, they're usually unskilled labor, uh, lower classes, socially marginalized, disenfranchised, not given a clear road to integration in any way, or being allowed to be participants in the society in a clear way. So there's a much um, larger chance, or, or, or there's more of an impetus to reject their new country and to go and fight with this group that claims to be the true, real Islam against the big, bad, evil Western system. I think that's very uh, appealing for a lot of people. Um, and 
part of that, I think, is you know, cultural trauma of integration. But part of that, you know, it's like Che Guevaraism. You know, I don't know. Some of you maybe have Che Guevara T-shirts on because you're in college or something like that. I mean, I remember there was this one image of Jay Z, and he was wearing a Che Guevara T-shirt, and he had a diamond necklace. And the diamond necklace was like, as he's walking, was like hitting Che Guevara in the forehead. And I just remember, you know, this is a really weird way to think about Che Guevara. But people love Che Guevara because he's this revolutionary who stood up against the man. And uh, people who are in Princeton University and therefore probably part of the man, uh, they still like Che Guevara. And you, there's this there's this appeal of of anti-establishment establishmentarianism and um, you know standing up for against the, the system. And that also is very appealing. And that's why a lot of these jihadi groups will really play that uh, on that court in their international presentations. They'll say, you know, they'll kind of play the anti-colonial role, the anti, you know, worldwide anti-colonialism, worldwide anti-imperialism. Um, and, and I think a lot of them may be sincere in that. But sometimes I think they're, they're, they know that that's something that resonates with Muslim populations abroad. You know, if you see, if you're sitting in, if you're sitting in the UK, and the UK government is supporting the Israeli government, which has killed you know 2,300 civilians in Gaza and 518 kids, and you know then suddenly no one's talking about human rights. But then they start talking about how human rights matter when one Western person gets killed in Iraq, but not when 700,000 Iraqis get killed. Imagine you're some a Muslim youth in the UK who is always being called the dirty Paki, doesn't know what he's going to do with his life, uh, being told he's not going to fit in, doesn't know how to fit in. Um, Maybe you'll go and fight with the other side. I think that's a, we have to take uh, that into account as being a real issue. Uh, yes. Sir. Jack contemplates this question. Uh, this question: If uh, people could just move in, so that so people who are outside can come in, mm -hmm. and so if there's some chairs available, just come on in. I mean, this is an interesting question, um, and I mean, I'd have to really think about it. But I think that I would challenge or I would push back a little bit on the initial premise, which is that these groups start out extremists and then become, or let's say start out violent and then become social aid or... No, they start out more social. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think that groups, let's say like ISIS, you know, they start out as militant organizations. Uh, groups like Hamas start out as militant organizations. Islamic Jihad start out as uh, militant organizations. Um, groups like the... The groups that start out as more social or educational organizations tend to basically, I think, stay that way, at least in the modern Middle East that I can think of. Something like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, or the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan, the Muslim Brotherhood in you know, Morocco, or uh, you know, they start out as basically social organizations or religious educational organizations, and occasionally there's some small flare of violence, but I mean, generally they, they remain that uh, until the present day. Um, so. I think that, I mean, if you are a social or educational organization that's Islamically oriented, and you find yourself in a conflict, a violent conflict, where it seems to be very clear what, like, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, the Damascus branch at least was traditionally much, you know, more, uh, was politically not really involved, uh, not advocating violence. Um, but then during the Syrian civil war, this, this group becomes, you know, a, a part of the resistance against Bashar al-Assad, violent resistance. But then you have groups like, uh, you know, like uh, Hezbollah, which start out at the very beginning, the very beginning as a, as a military organization, and then transmute into something totally different, which is primarily, uh, you know, just a, a kind of a creature with lots of different arms. 
Some of it's military, some of it's social, some of it's political. I think it's, uh, and, and clearly if you want to gain legitimacy, you know, what better way to do that than to say, you know, we're not just, we haven't just taken over as big bad ISIS guys, we're also gonna, you know, pave the streets, or we're gonna make sure that poor people are getting food, or we're gonna get the lights working again. So he, ISIS has been putting all these pictures up of, you know, them fixing street lights and, you know, <laughs> bulldozing, like, tree stumps and that are in the way. It's pretty, you know, prosaic pictures, they're pretty funny though. Get these ISIS guys like, no, a little to the left. No. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, I'm trying to be just by going this way, this way, this way, just so you know my system. Uh, so we'll go over here, and then we'll come back to the middle. Thank you. Uh, I came in a little late, and I don't know if you addressed it or not, but I'll bring it up at the end because it always bothers me. The, uh, we have, uh, I, I love the title of your book, Escorting Muhammad. Just aptly describe the whole conversation, really, that's at the heart of the problem for hundreds of years, not today. The, the issue, I, just to set it up, the issue has been <coughs> that 250 years after Rasulullah's death, we have this whole process of quotation starts. So they develop a science of quotation, you know, how to, to do it. Now that science itself becomes a problem itself because everybody else after that starts quoting that science but because of that science, everything done prior to that, uh, everything done by that science is probably correct, which is probably not right because in the 250 years, I, you know, I, I don't remember things I did 25 days ago, let alone 250 years ago, anybody could describe anything about anything. So the problem we have today is this whole set of things that people have evolved. And, you know, as to Muhammad's personal effects on, you know, he, he watches face to the right hand, that's not <coughs> impacting the, the affairs. But this beheading can impact a whole bunch of people, including the guy who was getting beheaded. So you have this problem that needs to somehow get resolved. And it doesn't seem like people are stepping up to the, to and, and saying that we need to start thinking that Muhammad is being misquoted out of Quran itself. You know, and therefore, let's not misquote Rasulullah, which is not in the Quran, but stay with what is otherwise and start looking at things in a different way. And I just want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, I mean, that it's a, a you know, fair point. Um, Although, you know, the process of recording the hadith begins, you know, during, really during the Prophet's lifetime. When you say 250 years, I mean, the, the main surviving hadith collections are from, you know, 200 to, to let's say, 250 <coughs> years after the death of the Prophet. But there are earlier hadith collections. Some of them have survived. Um, and, and some of them haven't survived just because, you know, they were written on papyrus and parchment, things like that. Um, some of them, it was, some of it wasn't written down at all. It was orally transmitted. Uh, so the question of you know whether or not the books of Hadith in Sunni or Shia Islam, whether or not they accurately represent the Prophet's real teaching, that's a fair debate, you know, which which people have been having and continue having have been having since the beginning of the Islamic tradition. Uh, but it, it's important to to to, to realize. And I think a lot of people don't know this. It's not like Muslim scholars collected these books of hadith, and then they went out to the Muslim people and they said, okay, here are these books of hadith, here's the Quran, now some committee form and figure out Islamic law and figure out Islamic theology. It's not, the, all the schools of Islamic law developed before these books were, were compiled and based on bodies of hadith that were specific to those schools, whether it was in Kufa in southern Iraq or Medina or Syria or Egypt, or Basra in Iraq, they had their own bodies of material. The schools of Islamic theology also developed with different bodies of hadith. So that's why if you go back and look at early Islamic theological writings, let's say in the Ashari school of theology, you see that the, they're citing hadith that are really weird. They don't, they don't even appear in any real mainstream collections because they had their own body of material. Uh, what happens is after that, these different schools of law and theology have to start justifying their existing bodies of law and theology with reference to these new collections of hadith. They don't necessarily change their law and theology, they just start justifying it. You know, like 
if um, you know whenever you know whenever uh, some new you know your new ideology comes out, like let's say let's say now I have to justify everything I believe in light of I don't know, um, for, you know Tea Party ideology. I start saying, well, you know, this Tea Party guy says this, and that's exactly what I believe, and this Tea Party person says that, and look, this is what I've position I've been holding too. You start figuring out how to justify your existing positions based on an external body of material. So uh, that's you know I don't think that the nature of Islamic tradition was uh, altered significantly by these uh, these collections of hadith. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that I kind of struggle with in the academic in my academic life is um, not necessarily like misquoting the Prophet, but like misrepresenting, like well dealing with misrepresentation misrepresentations of him, but also kind of getting caught in this trap of well, like in response to all the violence that's committed in the name of Islam, you know, like we always like to say, you know, the Prophet was very peaceful, um, you know, like, would never like condone like unjust violence or anything like that. Um, um, but then there are certain instances like in like early Muslim history when Muslims do become involved in like, you know, warfare or like violence. So I find in those situations kind of, you know, like people, people who have been listening to me and my version of the peaceful, like, you know, like, Islam and like kind of turning around and asking, well, you know, how does that fit into what you've been saying? Um, and so I like I kind of struggle with this like black and white, you know, like representation that we sometimes have of the prophet, even even in like on like erring on the side of you know the prophet was very like always like you know would recommend peace. Um, so kind of how do you suggest that? you know, a student like me develops like a more balanced view. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that the, you know, the prophet was a leader of a political community. That political community was being attacked. I mean, first of all, he'd been, ex he and his followers had been expelled from their homes and their refugees uh, with the right, even today, you know, UN guaranteed right to go, to, to, to recover their land and their possessions. So he's, his political life begins in a position, in a conflict. So his, the majority of his years of political leader for the, la the, sec the last 10 years of his life and his mission is a, a, a leader who's at war much of the time. So, you know, the, you know the, he was not just a guy who was going and loving his neighbor. I mean, he was, you know, he was a, a person who was involved in war. And the Quran deals with issues of warfare and how do you conduct how do you conduct yourself in war, what constitutes a valid cause for war. Uh, and you know, I, I, I look, you know, when you look at the, the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet, in my opinion, you know, you don't find um, legitimate reasons for violence that are dramatically different from what I think a, a normal American would consider legitimate reasons for violence. You can fight if you're attacked. You can fight if you've been driven from your home and you've been treated unjustly. You can fight to protect the rights of others. You can fight if you're being religiously oppressed. But you can't respond disproportionately. If someone wants peace and justice, you can't say no. If someone has a treaty with you and they haven't violated the treaty, you can't attack them. Right? Don't be an aggressor. God doesn't love the aggressors, as the Quran says. So I mean, uh, uh, you know, during warfare, you can't kill, as the prophet said, you can't kill women, you can't kill children, you can't kill old men, you can't kill monks, unless they fight you. If there's some, you know, Shaolin monks on the battlefield <laughs> wielding all sorts of weapons, then you know that you can fight them. Which is, you know, uh, not so different from uh, rules of engagement or, or laws of war uh, that are, are well you know, well known to the rest of the world. Uh, so, um, what, what you see when you, you see instances of of maybe violence is disturbing from, let's say, a group like ISIS, like a beheading. Uh, this is something, by the way, that's condemned by uh, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of Muslim scholars. I mean, I don't know any, I read one treatise by a Muslim scholar, is anonymous, defending the ISIS beheadings. It's actually really weird, it's a very interesting, weird treatise. But uh, he argues that 
you can you can you can cut people's heads off, but it's debated whether you can carry the head somewhere else. So the but you know if, if you look at the way his this one scholar anonymous phrases it, they phrase the whole thing politically. They start out it's written right after the, the it's dated it's an internet document it's dated right after the the first beheading, and it says people have forgotten. All the Iraqis who were killed, and it, Israel just killed all these Palestinians, and America supported these these killings, and now everybody's crying over one dead American. So that's political. And then at the end, what does he say? He says, "Islam is not a religion that is about turning the other cheek." He says, "We're not like what the Gandhiin Gandhi followers and Mandelian <laughs> Mandela followers. We're not." It, so it's, it, both the the argument, the size of the argument, it's like bookmarked by these political, very clear political positions. Uh, so that was, that's really for me, you know, I don't see these as political messages, or sorry, religious messages or religious treatises, just political treatises. And when you look at, I always have my students read this in my Islamic world class, look at uh, Osama bin Laden's declaration of war against the United States in 1996. It's in a, a collection called Messages to the World. Very interesting. What is his argument for why it's okay to kill American civilians? His argument is, America is a democracy where the people choose the leaders and choose the government, the policies of that government, so they're accountable to the policies of that government. That's, that's not an Islamic argument. That is nowhere in the Islamic tradition where you find that argument. Nowhere. That's an extremist argument. Guess who else uses this argument? I, my head almost exploded when I saw this. I was watching this documentary called The Man from Plains, Georgia, about Jimmy Carter. Anyone ever see, ever see this? There's some famous documentary film. I don't like documentaries. My wife loves them, so I watch them. So it's about Jimmy Carter. And he has an interview with uh, Alan Dershowitz. And the interviewer asks Alan Dershowitz, why is it OK for Israel to kill civilians in Gaza? And he says, civilians in Gaza voted for a mass government, so they're responsible. He says, oh my god, this is the same argument Osama bin Laden uses. That, that's an extremist argument. It's not the property of Muslims. It's not produced by Islam. It's not produced by Christianity. This is an extremist argument where rather idiotically, but in somehow logically coherently, a population that is seen as choosing a government or approving it is held responsible for the unjust actions of that government, which is, of course, ridiculous. <laughs> Having just voted today. Hassan? And then my question is about uh, the anti-gay movement. As an Islamic scholar, what are your views about the anti-gay movement? Would you differentiate between the Lahore anti-gay movement and the Pakistan anti between the Lahore and Qadiani? Uh, yeah. Okay, so the uh, Ahmadiyya movement goes back to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who died in 1902. 1919. Yeah. Wait, no, no, somebody give me a date. 1919. 1919. 1919. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I was a little bit off. So uh, uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, uh, who's from. Um, Muslim scholar in British occupied India said uh, in the Punjab, right? Says that uh, he is the return of Jesus. The, the, the third, in the Islamic tradition, Muslims all believe Jesus is going to come back at the end of time. So he's, he's the return person of Jesus. And uh, that, of course, caused a lot of controversy. In terms of uh, Ahmadiyya doctrine, besides that, I don't think that there's many differences between Ahmadiyya, let's say, uh, Islam and regular Sunni Islam, except that they don't believe in any violent jihad, and their authority structure is much more focused around the successors of Mirza Wala Ahmed. So they don't have a problem of decentralized authority like the other Sunni schools have. Uh, but the, the, so the, the real central issue is this claim about Mirza Wala Ahmed being uh, the return of Jesus. Um, and a lot of other Muslim scholars rejected that and saw it as very dangerous because they saw it as breaking with that fundamental position that the Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet. Um, now, what the Ahmadiyya Muslims say, as a defense of that, they say, we don't believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is a prophet in the sense that you're saying he is. He's a, he's a non-law-bringing prophet. So yes, he's a in sort of a prophet, but he's not a prophet like Muhammad was. Uh, so this, this dispute causes a lot of rancor. And uh, in the, the government of Pakistan, uh, let's say the government of Saudi Arabia uh, don't consider Ahmadi to be Ahmadiyya to be actual Muslims. Ahmadis themselves consider themselves to be Muslims. I think that the Qadiani school is more 
has a stronger claim about Mirdullah Muhammad's prophecy than the Lahore school, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's my position toward that? Yeah. Like personally? Yeah, personally, as an Islamic scholar. Well, I mean, I don't really know how to distinguish my position as a scholar from my position personally. So I'll just say what my position is based on what I know or what I think of. Um, I mean, I don't uh, agree with the claim that Mirza Allah Muhammad was the return of Jesus. I don't really know a lot about it, but I, I mean, just until I was given pretty good evidence, I wouldn't believe it. But I mean, I consider Ahmadi Muslims be, to be Muslims like other Muslims, because I, what? Yeah, I mean, that's my own personal position. There, there are too many problems in the world to, uh, to you know, kick people out of Islam for this. And I, I mean, I, uh, I know that might be controversial, but I mean, I, I, I've not seen anything come from the Ahmadi community that's not uh, you know, very you know, excellent morally and, uh, and very useful and good. Uh, Gina? Um, so I wanted to go back to the discussion of using reason in hadith, and you guys were talking about how like the scholars um, eventually had to start using reason to distinguish what was authentic and what was inauthentic. So my question is, how are we supposed to um, take that as non-scholars, like as Muslims living our daily life? Should we approach hadith with that level of skepticism, mm -hmm. or should we have that kind of blind acceptance of the mm -hmm. prophet as our moral center? I mean, first of all, important fact, you know, as a Muslim, you're not required to believe anything that you haven't been convinced of. That's just a fact. Bring your evidence if you're truthful, so is what the Quran says, right? So someone, you, you don't just have to believe in something because somebody says this is what you have to believe. Mm -hmm. They have to give you evidence. If, uh, you know, that's why if you're, you're a Muslim, let's say I tell you a hadith. And you don't like the hadith. Uh, if that's not a, if that's not, if what I'm saying, like I say, you have to pray five times a day. If you say no, I don't, then you're not Muslim. You might not pray five times a day because you know you're lazy or you're busy or you have stuff, you know. But then you're just not being a good Muslim. You say I don't have to, then you are rejecting some essential part of the religion. If if I come and tell you just one hadith. And you don't like it, that doesn't that you might be mistaken in that, you might be committing a sin in doing that, but you're still Muslim. I can't I might be angry at you, I might say you need to listen to me, but I can't say you're not Muslim. I can just say you're misled. Right? And this is a well established position in the Islamic tradition. Uh, so I think it is important that Muslims uh, demand evidence for what they're being told to believe about their religion. Uh, however, I would also say that uh, individual hadiths are are little pieces of data, okay? and just like you know, we could go find uh, the elections are just are now over, but you can probably find lots of you know Republican clips online about President Obama saying things, or Democratic clips online about Mitch McConnell saying things. You'll get them saying something really crazy. You know, it's taken out of context, or it's meant for a specific situation and not a general situation, or it's meant for you know, to be understood sarcastically and not literally, something like that. So uh, the same thing with hadith. They're just little pieces of data that on their own are inconclusive. They have to be fit into a larger structure, which is the job of Muslim scholars to do. So if, some, if, you, if you find a piece of hadith that you find disturbing or you don't understand it, my suggestion to you would simply to be to reserve judgment. Because you're in no way required to believe this. But also, I don't think that you should get in, and I don't think I, should get in the habit of taking what a, a 20, 2014 upper middle class white American thinks is truth and falsehood. That's not the universal definition of truth and falsehood, okay? That's just not. What I think is good, tasty food, what I think is disgusting, what Americans think is good, tasty food, what Americans think is disgusting, not universal. But we need to be very careful that we're not judging things too hastily. But at the same time, uh, my advice is just to reserve judgment and to consult uh, people who you respect uh, who are knowledgeable about their religion. Um, just uh, wondering what led you to um, gaining an interest into Islam? What ga led me to gain interest? Mm -hmm. Well, I was uh, you know, at a Jesuit university as an undergraduate, Georgetown University. 
And so you have to take uh, two theology classes. So I took one on biblical literature, it was very interesting. I took one on Islam randomly, and I got very interested, and that was it. Ever since, that was 1997. Okay, so what we're gonna do at this point is, uh, because we've reached the uh, 8.30 mark, um, and that's typically when our programs end, is that anyone who has a question that they really just wanna ask and they'll feel very sad if they don't ask <laughs> it, uh, before leaving, um, I want you to ask your question, and we're gonna take the questions, uh, you know, and then uh, Dr. Brown will uh, try to answer as many. I'll do it really quickly. Yeah, and you can, if you wanna, if you wanna take a few, in case you wanna write down any questions. Oh yeah, okay. Okay. yeah, So we'll start here. Rapidly, no comments, just questions. Yeah, yes. just questions. Mm -hmm. Rapid okay. So um, a lot of the comments that came out today, it addressed a lot of the political tensions that exist that uh, affect Muslims. So for <laughs> Muslims in America or American <laughs> Muslims, do you find that the politics are pushing uh, where we're going uh, socially or what our lens is and how we view our religion? I found your book to be timely because it talks about the roots of a lot of the strands of Islamic thought. Do you find Muslims getting away from the sources and the religion itself in coming to their conclusions, especially after eight years of President Bush and being pushed very much so to the left? Has that affected Muslims socially and also how we think about what our beliefs are? Okay. Like, do we judge Islam by our beliefs or? Good question. Good question. All right. Yes. Over here. Uh, uh, quick question. Um, given that uh, a large number of Muslims had a, a, a great longing for this thing called Khilafat, Caliphate, for like 100, maybe 150 years, uh, if we were to take out all the offensive things that the ISIS are doing, like beheadings and you know persecuting the Yazidis, what what is the what is the scholarly argument against those guys from somebody like you? Because I mean, the caliphate if is something that caliphate offensive. is something that the, the Muslims yeah. have been romanticizing okay, better, for a couple okay. hundred years. Got it. Up there, those two. Yep. In the latter half of the 20th century, I guess there was a movement to authenticate hadith more amongst Muslim scholars. <coughs> I just want to know on the whole, do you think that did more harm or good? All right. Um, real quick question, you're getting a lot of like hard stuff, so feel free to skip it if it's uh, um, Anyway, uh, my question is pretty basic on uh, uh, the issue of sex slavery and whether that's, um, I mean, based on my research, it's something that I, I've seen a lot in books of fiction, things like that, and um, I'm just wondering how that plays out and how do we understand our history in the light of that, um, just whatever you want to do. If we talk about Quran, we talk about Hadith, we talk about Sunnah, what about the actual life of the Prophet? Because it was such a 23 years of, of Dawah, there were times where the first three years of the Dawah he said, you know, don't even migrate. Even if you believe in my movement, don't, don't migrate. We don't need your support yet. Go back. Uh, and later on, <coughs> as we were able to build up military efficacy, we were able to even defend uh, uh, persecuted Muslim populations. How important do you say it is the time frame to know when certain rulings were made over the course of the Prophet's lifetime okay. and how you have the question? Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to switch, and I think these are like a lot of yeah, questions. Yeah. So let's take, yeah, let's take this and like, question we'll take this side and then. Question. Question. Okay. So uh, let's start here. I mean, I think that the question of American Muslims is a fascinating issue. Uh, anybody who wants to study it or, or read about it, it's a great, I mean, the American Muslim community is fascinating because it's uh, socially conservative, but uh, because the kind of gen overall, let's say, let's say right-wing Christian or conservative Christian movement is the so hostile in its majority, so hostile to Muslims, that one's pushing these, you know, anti-Sharia laws. Well, actually, it's, uh, a lot of uh, really extremist Jewish, or Jewish organizations are also pushing it. There's a great report by uh, American Enterprise Institute called Fear Incorporated that traces the financial roots of Islamophobia. It's very interesting. Um, so they've been pushed into to, to liberal stuff, right? So in the 2000 election, the this is a fact. Muslims got George Bush elected. The Muslim vote in Florida 
with more yeah. than the number by which B George Bush yeah. won in Florida. <laughs> so Muslims got George Bush elected <laughs> because George Bush said, hey, we're conservatives too. And he said, we love the Constitution. The Constitution <coughs> says freedom of uh, religious belief. He, in a debate with Al Gore, said, spoke out against uh, racial profiling and against secret evidence, which American Muslims were being held under. Back then, this now it's like you know normal. Back then, it was a big deal. Muslims being held under surveillance. So Muslims, uh, a lot of Muslims voted for the Republicans in 2000, and then 9/11 happened, and it was bad news from there. So Muslims now nowadays, who's out there defending Muslim rights? Are uh, gay rights advocates? Uh, leftists, right? Uh, people, people who are, you know, atheists and uh, gay rights and social liberals. So Muslims, these are the only people who support Muslims. The Muslims find themselves drawn uh, a lot to, to this group, uh, and so they, in this, they're in a real challenge, uh, kind of a bind or a contradiction, where their uh, their political allies are people with whom they have big disagreements in general, and I'm not sure how that's going to resolve itself. That's a big question. The question of uh, caliphate, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if, if uh, the question of whose can be a valid caliph, uh, what is required to make that person a valid caliph, uh, has been debated a great deal. Uh, since the abolition of, abolition of the caliphate in 1924, uh, there have been a number, immediately after there are a number of candidates who would, would have liked to be the caliph. We tried to get other people to push them, the king of Mecca, the king of Egypt, uh, they didn't sense that there was enough support for them to get to that, so they never made these claims. I think that's interesting, because it shows that uh, the claim itself, people don't want to make the claim if they don't know it's going to be accepted, at least by some large percentage of, or representation of Muslims. Uh, ISIS didn't have that problem, they just came out and said we're a caliph. Then the people in Boko Haram said they're caliphs. And uh, so, I mean, I, uh, if if somebody was a wonderful, enlightened monarch, enlightened ruler, and they wanted to have a caliphate, and it turned into a wonderful place where you could get jobs, and you know there was great uh, coffee and stuff like that, I don't know, maybe I'd immigrate there or something. But it, that's not, you know, seem to be on in the cards right now. So I think, it, in a way, uh, I don't, I don't know how to answer the question. Uh, so his question is too to be detailed for this audience. Your question was about, yeah, it's very important to talk about when the prophet's hadiths are said. <coughs> if he makes, and also Quranic verses, so Quranic verses that come during a time of war and that talk to a group of Muslims specifically about how to deal with that conflict, they should be interpreted as being specific and not as general commands. Same thing with prophetic hadiths. And the Muslim scholars, their one of their challenges has been trying to figure out when did the prophet say this? When did this Quranic verse get revealed? What is its legal uh, implication? So that's very important. And different opinions about those contexts will give you different results. Sex slavery, uh, this is a, you know, this is a real uh, issue in the modern world for Muslims. You know, the Quran takes slavery as a fact. It takes it as a, it was, it was an economic and social fact in the late antique world. For most of human s history, s slavery was a, a fact as an economic condition, primarily not necessarily a racial thing. Uh, the Quran makes it clear that Freeing slaves is a good deed, that a believer in God will free slaves, but it, uh, and it places, the prophet's teachings place restrictions on how you can treat slaves. You have to feed them from your food, you have to clothe them from your clothing, you can't uh, burden them with more than what they can do. Uh, but, uh, so, but it doesn't say slavery is evil, so in slavery. So slavery, and, and you know, sex slavery, if you have, you can have, the concubine speaks very, uh, sorry, the Quran speaks very clearly about concubines, this was a, a, a reality, as a, usually a product of, of people being uh, captured as prisoners of war, as it was in the rest of the Near East. If a woman, uh, if a female concubine becomes pregnant from her owner or a master, the child is free when the, uh, the father dies, and the, the mother uh, becomes free as well, and she can't be sold after that. So there's, there's lots of restrictions and rules placed around slavery, but one, it's not abolished, Two, we know in certain instances in Islamic history, again, a vast area of space and time, uh, you have some, you know, tr slaves are terribly mistreated. Uh, they're generally just treated like slaves in their uh, non-Muslims in, in those regions. So uh, this really doesn't change until Muslims start being affected by the abolition movement in the UK 
and by British efforts to abolish slavery in West Africa and North Africa. And so in the 1860s, actually the 1840s, the Bay of Tunis, the, the ruler, Ottoman ruler of Tun Tunisia abolishes, first takes primary steps towards abolishing slavery, then abolishes it completely. Under the, with the argument that because Muslims were not meeting the Sharia requirements for slavery, therefore they couldn't legitimately have slavery. That's an interesting argument, but the fact of the matter is, I don't think they ever would have made that argument if they hadn't been confronted by British abolitionist movements. So uh, now, since all Muslim countries and all countries have outlawed slavery, at least in theory, since the 1960s, um, <coughs> Muslims, uh, one response by Muslim scholars is, you know, uh, yes, in theory, slavery is allowed, but it's what's, called, this, what's happened is called the Habib Mahal. There's no longer any actual legal uh, matter for this ruling to cling to. It's no longer, it's like a moot point. It's not applicable anymore. So therefore, uh, because Muslim governments have signed these treaties, which they're bound by, they can't uh, begin this practice. Okay, in the middle, one, two. All right, that's it. So ask your question. Ask your question. Uh, I'm just, uh, if you can elaborate upon the Mataz um, movement within uh, Islam, um, when it comes to interpretation of uh, matters of, uh, um, I guess, religion, theory, etc., um, it seems to me that initially there was this uh, fairly strong rationalist movement, which um, basically claimed that reason was the final arbiter in all matters, uh, almost uh, an agnostic movement of sorts. Um, I believe that it's still sort of surviving the Shiite tradition, but largely uh, died out in mainstream Sunni Islam. So, um, <coughs> Uh, in your book, you respond to claims that uh, the Prophet was unethical in some of his actions. And I think uh, you use the example of a uh, child uh, bride. And uh, the argument that you make is that we shouldn't, you know, as a modern society, use our own ethics, you know, specific to our time and space that are contingent to us to judge, you know, uh, other societies. But if we flip the question around, <coughs> do you think there's a problem within Muslims, amongst Muslims, to use the ethics of seventh century Arabia as a no in, in making normative claims that this must be correct because the Quran or because the Prophet uh, did it, rather than being looking at it as historically contingent. And then, if that's a problem, if that is a tension within the tradition, what should Muslims do, uh, you know, to, to, to solve that? Um, what is the authority to understanding ethics in twenty first century America? Wow. Any other hard <laughs> questions? <laughs> Easy questions. <laughs> 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 Yeah, uh, some, uh, something that I have always struggled with was um, how our intention plays into interpreting hadiths and its an eventual application on our lives. Like the hadith with uh, doing your eyebrows, um, whether or not if our intention is correct, are, is it permissible to do it? Because the context of the eyebrows is with prostitutes. So just that kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. so it's a hadith that you know, appears to forbid you know, adjusting your eyebrows. So, uh, Mu'tazilism school of thought traced back to about 750 of the uh, Common Era. Um, when you think it, it starts in Basra and Baghdad, becomes very influential, um, eventually dies out in Sunni Islam by the 1300s, but it becomes the main school of thought in 12 Shia Islam and Zaydi Islam. But it's also important to rem remember that it, it died out in theory in Sunni Islam, but actually, <coughs> All Sunni legal theory is, and Sunni epistemology is primarily Mu'tazila. So it has a, it kind of uh, passes on its genetic material into Sunni Islam as well. They, they, they weren't agnostics, uh, and and by rationalists, what they they don't say that human reason is necessarily the final arbiter. I mean, they they believed in revelation, they believed in the Quran, they believed in the Sunnah of the Prophet. But what they said is that uh, human reason can arrive at knowledge of what's right and wrong, what is required for God and forbidden for God, uh, without revelation. So human beings can arrive at fundamental metaphysical truths without revelation. They can get that just from reason. Revelation is, in a sense, extra. Uh, but they were not um, skeptics in this. I mean, they, they followed the Quran. They, they were very skeptical about claims of individual hadiths that seemed to them to contradict reason. 
Uh, but they uh, they didn't use reason. They didn't think reason was sort of the um, the, the king of everything. And they, they in the end they were you know they believed in God and the teachings of the prophet. They just were believe it. And in Sunni Islam, you see actually the same positions continue. It's just phrased in different language with more like cautionary barriers placed around it. Um, uh, Nabil's question. Yeah, I mean, I think that there, we, we have to understand the nature of how the Islamic normative system works. I mean, there's certain things Muslims are required to do. There's certain things Muslims are prohibited from doing. Okay, so Muslims are, unless you're dying of thirst, you can't drink alcohol. Okay? Alcohol is never going to be allowed. There's never going to come a time in some certain place where alcohol is going to be allowed. Okay? Uh, Muslims are required to pray. Unless you're in a coma, you have to pray. Even if you're sick, even if you can't move, pray with your eyeballs. If you, some schools of law, after you wake up from the coma, you have to go back and make up all the prayers you missed. Okay? So that's always going to be the case. But there's lots of other things that are that are contingent or partially contingent. Um, what, uh, for example, when the best time to marry somebody? What's the appropriate age for marriage? This is, uh, you you Muslims are not required to marry someone who's very young. They can marry, uh, according to you know the, all the schools of Islamic law. You're not allowed to have sex with somebody who can't physically withstand having sex. But ultimately, that decision is, has to be made by the groom, the bride, and the bride's guardian. Or, if there's no guardian, then some kind of court official. Um, we can sit and have lots of discussions about what's, given the reality of our life, let's say in the United States, where people attend s school through uh, you know, eighth grade, and then they're, or tenth grade, and they're you know, highly encouraged to go through high school, and people want to go to college, people want to go to medical school, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. We see the, the improvements that education can give for, for uh, people's well-being, their religious well-being, their worldly well-being. We can have a discussion about what's the appropriate restrictions that we can put as, as, administrator or as administrators or as local governments on marriage. We can say, you know, you can't marry someone who's under 16 or you can't marry someone who's under 18 because we think this is better for uh, people's welfare in our time and place. That's completely <laughs> acceptable for Muslims. And Muslim scholars have done this. They did it in the Ottoman Empire. They did it in Egypt. They did it in Syria. They did it. In, you know, they've done it in almost uh, you know every Muslim country I can think of. So, uh, you know, we don't. If you you don't have to live exactly like the Prophet lived. Uh, you can if you want, uh, unless it's been determined by the government under which you're living that an optional part of religious practice, an optional part of following the Prophet, is actually leading to social harm that outweighs that. The, the benefit that you get as a Muslim for getting the extra credit of following the Prophet in that way. And then the, the eyebrows hadith is a perfect example. A hadith is a piece of information. The Prophet doesn't, um, and when the Prophet says that uh, someone who, who drags their clothing behind them is, that clothing is in hellfire. That doesn't mean that you can't wear jeans that drag on the ground, or when you, you, you it says in a similar hadith that you know if your if your robes go below the, below the middle of your calf, then this part of your body is in hellfire. Yeah, if you look at other the other versions of this hadith, say specifically those people who drag their clothes out of arrogance. And one person comes to the prophet and says, you know, when I walk, one of my legs, one of my my robes is always dragging on the ground because my one of my legs is shorter than the other. I just walk that way. The prophet says that's not a problem because you're not doing it out of arrogance. So here, the, 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 the reason behind the hadith is clear, that people are dragging their clothes in the dirt to show how rich they are because they have someone to wash their clothes, they have lots of extra pairs of clothes. Um, and so it's important to see what's the reason behind it, not just get caught up in the wording itself. So what is the reason behind, you know, is in, in seventh century Arabia, was uh, adjusting your eyebrows a uh, habit of prostitutes? If so, then you wouldn't be allowed to do it. Today, in the United States, if there's a certain practice that is associated with iniquitous behavior, Muslims should can't do that practice. So let's say, you know, let's say having lots of piercings is associated with like degenerate behavior. I'm not saying it is, I'm not saying that that's what it means. We're saying if that's what people's perception is, there's a strong argument amongst Muslim scholars that you shouldn't be able to do that because it's what's called shu'ar fisk. It's a uh, it's a symbol of iniquitous behavior. So you're not only uh, there might be things you might be able to adjust your eyebrows now. 
but you might not be able to do other things. Like Prophet Muhammad used to wear kohal under his eyes, like eyeliner, like Keith Richards. Now, if you do that, people think you're trying to be like Keith Richards, which is not necessarily a moral example. So you can't, uh, you know, Muslims maybe should not wear a coal under your eyes today. Final, this side of the room. Yes, hold on. That's okay. it. And then we're done. Anyone? Huh? Going once? Going twice? Okay. All right. I just in, in all the Abrahamic faiths, there's a big emphasis on doing good so you can go to heaven and not doing bad things so you go to heaven. Why, why isn't it just do good for the sake of good? This is a very, very, very good question. And I, it's interesting, you know, when I think that uh, if I'm gonna, my own reaction, I remember when I was, uh, I met this one Muslim scholar once in Kuwait, and he, he was talking, he said, you know, when I was in, I studied in the United States, and I went into the Muslim Student Association meeting and I, to the first day, and I said, I'm here, I'm not here for you. I'm not here, I'm here because I want to go to heaven. Right? So uh, that's what, and I remember thinking, it's such a really, it's a really weird motivation. You know? I mean, it doesn't seem re why you should do good deeds. Like, when you give someone, when you give a, a homeless person food, aren't you doing it altruistically for that person or for the sake of right? You know, am I doing this for my own benefit in the afterlife? The, the idiom that you see in the Quran for, let's say, um, Martyrdom is a commercial idiom. The Quran says, "Who you know, qardan hasana." Who will give to God a good loan, a goodly loan, that they will be re, re, uh, given back multiple times over in the afterlife? Um, so there's this idea that you're doing this for yourself. Uh, that's a that's the idiom that the Quran uses. I think that that idiom is foreign to some societies that have chosen to think about good deeds and justice and righteousness through uh, that in a way that is at least uh, ostensibly not selfish, not self-interested. However, you know, I, I think there's a really uh, good argument to have about whether or not, and you know, you're in college probably discussing this, I think, whether or not altruism really can exist. When someone does a good deed, uh, even for the, the sake of some abstract notion of morality, uh, are they not doing that for self-advancement? Are they not doing that to elevate their own standing in their eyes of the community? Are they not doing that uh, to feel better about themselves? Um, I think that uh, a lot of the times that we think about right as being not self-interested, it may actually have an element of self-interest involved. And it, it may be less than a matter of whether or not one tradition doesn't think of self-interest at all, another, another tradition kind of thinks of self-interest a lot. And it may be simply uh, levels of degree and shade of how, how much the, of the self-interest idiom you choose to engage in versus the altruistic idiom. I know that's a, probably not a very comprehensive answer, but that's, that's a good question. I don't really have much more of an answer than the one I gave you. All right, friends and folks, um, it was great spending time with you on this uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, please let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> and, uh, I look forward to seeing you all at the Hawali on Sunday and to a whole host of other programs. If you're not on the email list, please join the email list so we can keep in touch. Have a good evening.